So thank you very much. Yeah. So uh, hello everyone and welcome to the Aspire Technology Partners and Cisco Thousand Eyes a virtual wine tasting event. Thank you for joining us today. I hope that everyone is off to a great start in the new year. Today we have a very informative and fun event prepared for you. My name is Will Amaya. I am a senior solutions architect on the enterprise networking team here at Aspire. I'll be your MC for the first few minutes of today, and then I'll have some uh, closing comments near the end. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, this webinar is being recorded. All attendees will receive a link to the recording and a follow-up email. Please use the Q&A feature on the bottom right side of your screen for any questions you may have for any of our speakers. Uh, we would love to see you on video. Uh, please don't be shy, turn those cameras on, especially for the wine tasting. Um, also, if you have received your wine, feel free to take a moment and open it up now uh, to allow it to aerate a little bit. Okay. Today, we are pleased to partner with Thousand Eyes for this unique event. What could be cooler than learning about some really neat technology and hanging out with some of your peers, uh, hanging out with subject matter experts in Thousand Eyes, and also a subject matter expert in wine? Not me, by the way. Uh, Thousand Eyes has been a critical ecosystem, a partner for Aspire uh, in our work with numerous organizations, ranging from higher ed to private to commercial. Some of our customers have adopted Thousand Eyes because it was included with a previous Cisco purchase. Some were already customers prior to Thousand Eyes joining Cisco. But sadly, some of our clients don't even know that they may already have access to it today. If you have purchased a Cisco DNA Catalyst 9300 or 9400 series switch with either DNA Advantage or DNA Premier licensing, you already have access to it. If you're unsure and would like to find out more, feel free to reach out to your Aspire account manager and we'll be more than happy to assist. Our agenda for today will provide a brief overview of who we are and what we do. Uh, we will also talk about the Aspire and Thousand Eyes partnership. Uh, we will share some use cases. Uh, then we will perform a quick demo. And last, uh, we will uh, kick off our virtual wine tasting. Aspire is headquartered in Eatontown, New Jersey. We also have local operations in Mount Laurel, New Jersey, uh, White Plains, New York, and Albany, New York. We work with our customers for their business transformation by leveraging the power of digital to achieve their defined outcomes. For many clients, we also act as an extension of their IT teams. We are able to do this through our managed services offerings. Aspire's core strength is anchored in our dedicated team of experts delivering advanced technology solutions and services that revolve around what we do best, enterprise networking, collaboration, cybersecurity, data center and cloud, mobility, and IoT. A little bit about today's speakers. You have myself. Uh, my name is Will Amaya. I am a CCIE in routing and switching. I have been with Aspire for nearly 10 years but I've been in the industry for over 20. When I'm not designing or selling really cool network solutions, uh, I am coaching travel soccer for my son or basketball or working on my car. Uh, with us today, we also have Kirk O'Connor. Kirk is the client partner director representing Thousand Eyes. We also have Nate Wynn with us today. Nate is our partner account manager. And last but not least, we have Brian Allard, Brian is Boucher Vineyard's direct to consumer sales director. Brian is a former poet turned entrepreneurial clothing designer. His Napa Valley career uh, includes wine certifications and a wine business MBA. Brian is also going to be our sommelier this evening. So we have subject matter experts in Thousand Eyes and we have a subject matter expert in wine. Uh, and also uh, that is not a virtual background behind Brian. That is actually his office, and I'm very, very jealous. I will now turn it over to Kirk O'Connor. Thank you. Hey, guys. Actually, Nate Wynn's going to do the presentation today for us, so I'll hand it over to Nate. So I'm based in Washington, D.C., but nice to meet you guys. Okay. 
Thank you. Take it away, Nate. Well, uh, good afternoon and good evening to everybody on the call. My name is Nate Wynn, uh, one of the directors of the East over a thousand eyes. So exciting information today. I mean, we've, we, I'm sure you've heard of the acquisition through Cisco, um, but we've been partnering up with Aspire really to uh, really just blow the, the roof off of the thousand eyes knowledge and education and really just get this in front of as many people as possible. Um, I, I'm tenured under thousand eyes, been here for three years actually on Monday. So that was, uh, I just, just crossed that threshold. And um, it's, I, I know we got some New Yorkers and, and Buffalonians on the call as well. Go Bills coming up this, uh, this Saturday. So you got to shout out that one. Um, but we'll dive right in. This is not very salesy. Really, my job here is to help you understand exactly what we're doing in the industry and how we're assisting and really bringing back the visibility to the business, to you as, let's say, an IT director or a application owner. We're, we're, we're here really to expose what we've created over the last 10 years and what could kind of validate this more than Cisco really acquiring the company and then, and then bringing it to new levels than we really didn't think existed before. So excited to be here today um, and excited to show you the platform. So we will dive right in here. And just give me a little emoji thumbs up if you guys can see that. All right, cool. We got the emojis and the normal. <laughs> but so my name is Nate again. That's Kirk's Kirk's uh, info as well. Um, but just to give a, a kind of overview on where we sit, one of the main questions that we always get is, where do you guys play the most? Are you commercial? Are you enterprise? Are you in uh, the financial industry? Do you strictly stay in retail? My answer always is, if you leverage the internet, you can leverage Thousand Eyes. And that's kind of the beauty and the beast about the solution is that there's so many different ways you can start to leverage it and use it uh, and really implement it into your, your bigger business practice. Um, but what we like to show here is, is just how diversified we are across the industries. So we work with some smaller legal or medical firms that have 10 or 20 employees. And then, of course, you can see kind of the big logos here that we work with day in and day out, really to bring that visibility back to you as the business and as our customer. Um, and when it's saying that, people are like, well, what do you exactly mean? And I, I use all these legacy tools. I have an APM tool. I have monitoring solutions. And Thousand Eyes didn't create monitoring, right? This has been around for years and years. What we did is we extended the visibility that you are receiving as a business and as a business entity. And, and really where we play, uh, the, 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 I guess, the best and our bread and butter is within these four pillars. So cloud is the new DC, internet is the new network, SaaS is the new app stack, and then your home is the new branch office. So as we all are facing the craziness with COVID and Omicron and all this crazy stuff going on, we're realizing that it's becoming more and more apparent and normal to work from home or work from a coffee shop or just not work from a static office. And that's really where we're tying in all of these different capabilities of visibility and monitoring into one and uh, into one pane of glass. So that single pane of glass view. And we're not only just showing the connection to the front door of your cloud, of your SaaS, of your internet provider, but we're showing and penetrating into their environment, giving you what we like to call end-to-end -end visibility. So really from the laptop or the end user, all the way out, let's say to Gmail or Salesforce or your cloud or any server or DC that you may be leveraging day in and day out. Now, in a sense of value, where we're pushing this, why would you use Thousand Eyes? Pretty much your, your typical SaaS application or monitoring solution uh, approach here. So if it's revenue generating, it's an online solution to where customers may be transacting, uh, it's going to lose some revenue. Maybe it's going to, if it's, a, if it's an online platform that maybe you're just going on as a fan or as a user and you have a specific account, if it's not working or there's connectivity problems or there's issues that last not only hours but days or maybe even weeks, starts to, to damage that brand. And, and that really swoops in with, with the business continuity risk that are you operating at the most optimal level that you possibly can be? And do you have the visibility to go and mitigate that issue in real time? 
And what we found over the years is that a lot of really big time Fortune 100, even lower mom and pop, they do not have the tools to understand, mitigate, and troubleshoot these issues at, at a blink of an eye or in the first minute that it happens. This tends to be that war room story when you're fighting with Salesforce or you're fighting with CenturyLink or Verizon or AT&T saying, I can't connect to the internet. What the heck is going on here? And they're always like, well, we're green on our end, right? <laughs> the, the famous lines from all of these providers or all of these SaaS applications. Um, and in this sense, we're bringing you that, that control of saying, no, 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 here's exactly where the issue is occurring. Here is exactly where the isolated root cause is. Here's exactly the provider or the application that is dropping the packets or having loss or having latency or having some type of jitter. And we're able to do that, again, I'm going to harp on this over and over again, in real time. So it's more of a, a proactive and a reactive tool all in one. And then, of course, if you do have any major projects that are going to be launched within the next few weeks, or you're maybe already in it, Thousand Eyes is the number one solution in the world for SD-WAN uh, modernizations and cloud migrations, bringing you that visibility for pre, during, and post-migration. So allowing you to have that, that depth and that uh, really level of, of insight uh, for those specific transformation projects. Now, when we paint the story of Thousand Eyes, we, we sit and we, we talk about that monolithic presence, that, that everything is on premise or controlled internally. And a lot of these were, were used to kind of understand that. So that ping and pull, that net flow, packet capture, app agents, some synthetic testing, and then handhelds and people, of course. So when we look at this specific instance, that was the way it used to be, right? 90s, 2000s scenario, you had everything on premise, you built everything internally. And as time goes on, that little spider web is now this giant spider home to where there's a lot of reliance on your O365, your SAP, your CDNs, your DNS, your SaaS. And now we got pretty much everybody working from home um, in that remote worker sense, right? So if you're still in that sense, maybe you're working back towards the branch office, but either way, shape or form, Thousand Eyes is able to interconnect no matter what you're relying on, no matter what your backbone is, no matter what, what you're leveraging day in and day out, we're giving you that visibility from end to end, no matter what the scenario is. So we are all synthetic traffic. So I've been on this call for 17 minutes thus far. And within those 17 minutes, my computer has pinged 17 tests on this WebEx specific link to make sure that we are at an optimal connection with WebEx. So if we if my computer detected that prior to getting on the call, my IT team would, would already have been working on it so that I can get on with no problems at three o'clock on the dot, um, four o'clock on the dot, whatever that may be, right? So that's that's the sense of it being a proactive tool. Now, let's say at 320, I'm going to have an outage on my computer. As soon as that detects, we're able to escalate and elevate that issue to our internal teams. So we're aware fully um, as, as a business, and then actually escalate that directly to the providers. And I'll show you that in a little bit on what that looks like. Now, in a sense of what use cases we kind of sit, these are primaries. We, we went over the four pillars, the cloud, internet, SaaS, and users. But in, I guess, subsections, this is what we look at. So we always look at VoIP, think don't even just think Cisco. This is across any type of third party that you may be relying on. So think Zoom, Teams, WebEx, um, of course, Google Meet and BlueJeans. We have great, great use cases in that sense. Think in terms of what's relevant to you day in and day out. So what email do you leverage? Your Gmail, your 0365? Do you have something that you built internally? We're able to really give you that visibility across that spectrum. Um, and then any third parties. So I had mentioned the CDNs and DNS. If you're facing issues with those, this is giving you that, that kind of 2020 pair of glasses back to see that, that full spectrum on, on how it's performing and how it's operating. A lot of this has to do with across the network. A lot of this has to do with third parties, but that's really because it's our wheelhouse, right? It's, it's something that you as a company, as a business do not own and control. So how could you see into it? 
a lot of the monitoring solutions on uh, uh, for sale right now, they show you the front door connection. Did you shake hands with Facebook when you when you typed in your, your username and password? And from there, it doesn't really go to their DCs or the path trace that it's going to actually take to traverse the internet and get to that end uh, capable DC or server space in that sense or cloud space. So we're giving you that back. Cloud infrastructure, we manage, we, we mentioned that there, SD-WAN, and then we do have a security play as well. We don't like to start with this because we are not specifically a security tool, but there is a play there as well. Uh, so interconnecting on and off-prem capabilities, interconnecting end users, and then everything you leverage to, to really operate as a business. And then just to give you a little depiction of that, this is typically what those monitoring solutions will look like. So you got your branch offices connected out to your different locations, going all the way through the public internet, and then let's say delivering to Okta, delivering to O365, Workday, whatever that application may be. And in a sense, what Thousand, a Thousand Eyes is doing here is it's giving you that black box. It's giving you the flashlight to shine the light in the black box. So this is what we're uncovering. It's no more just a few hops in the beginning. It's showing end-to-end -end deliverable into their servers, into their cloud, really full extension into how those, those third parties are operating or how your on-prem is operating or how that end user is operating as well. So we like to label ourselves as the Google Maps of the internet. If you're familiar with Waze, W-A-Z-E, that, that kind of like Google Maps application, we, we act as the user almost... Um, Another analogy is like a helicopter. So I'll be sitting in uh, in the helicopter. Brian is in his car going down the highway, and I'm like, "Hey, there's some traffic coming up. You should take the service road. Get off here." Or, "Hey, there's a cop coming up. Slow down." Or, "Hey, maybe this is a better way to go." And we're giving you that that ten thousand foot view, and being able to bring it down all the way into a very granular sense of exactly what that looks like through waterfalls, through a bunch of different metrics that we can actually produce within the platform. Now, how do we do this? This is one of my last slides here. Uh, it's just through three agents, cloud agents, enterprise, and endpoint. Cloud and enterprise sit on the same type of technical sense. Cloud is just gonna be your inside out perspective. We own and control these agents. So this is gonna be a click and play scenario. Again, cloud outside in. Enterprise, only difference in technology here is it's an inside out perspective. So these are owned and operated, uh, or excuse me, the cloud are owned and operated by Thousand Eyes. The enterprise are deployed on premise. So these are gonna be for your VMs, your VAs, Docker containers, Linux packages, stuff of that sort. Those are very, very light lift. We, we have the capability to deploy those on a Raspberry Pi. So pretty easy uh, lift there. And then finally, the endpoint agent is there for the end user. So think workstations, laptops, desktops. This is really to interconnect the three from off-prem, on-prem, and then end user. So that's how we do that in that sense. Um, and, and just one more thing kind of to recognize here, our, our other offering is Internet Insights. So if you are a widespread national company or international company where you leverage a bunch of different users from out of state or out of the U.S., we have a global heat map for every major outage that has occurred within the last 24 hours. So this, de this takes no, no deployments, uh, no configuration. It's a pay to play scenario here. And you're able to really gain a, a, great, um, a great depiction and really analytical report on how the world is operating uh, in an internet sense. So think cloud, think internet. This is a great tool to leverage there. Um, and finally, where do we sit on a sense of other competitors? This is a question we always get. Your service now, your BMC, that's kind of your IT service, but we bundle up a lot of different solutions and a lot of different categories across the monitoring scene, really focusing on the network side and the SaaS side. So think in terms of third-party reliance, we're able to bring you that, uh, that on-prem visibility that you are getting with, with maybe a SolarWinds or a NetScout, but in a sense of building it all together, having it one pane of glass or single pane of glass, and really diversifying across how everything is operating at that one instance uh, each day, this is where we sit. So you can kind of see how it's differentiated there. And I will stop here. Any questions in regard to that?
All righty, Brian, we will give you the floor in five minutes. I'm just going to kind of go through a quick demo here. I'm a big believer in seeing is believing. Um, and this is very easily digestible here. So in this sense, what we're taking a look at is a bunch of different Thousand Eyes offices from a geo landscape. Uh, we're looking at Japan, England, France, New York, Texas, and California. So the test that we're taking a look at, think in terms of what you use every day. This can be in terms of a cloud infrastructure, could be in terms of your email that you use or of your Salesforce that you use, right? So this one is just a target URL on Salesforce, mission critical application for us to leverage day in and day out. And as we're taking a look at what we call the application layer, we are seeing a slight dip in availability here. So as we drill into where this is a, uh, kind of blocking us for the day or it's receiving some type of error, this is 0% availability for our direct users in France. So that's a problem. We can't access numbers, emails, we can't process quotes, we can't really create opportunities. There's a lot that inhibits us for day to day. So think in terms, how, do, how, would, how would your day be inhibited um, if, if it did go down and you couldn't get on? Now, in that sense, what we're going to take a look at is the network layer. So we went from application layer where we are seeing the dip in availability. We know there's a problem with the application, but we don't know exactly where the problem is occurring yet. So as we take a look at the overview, we're seeing at that 10, 10 times, the same time we're seeing the dip in availability, we're actually seeing a spike in loss. So now we're starting to unpeel the onion, understand that, okay, maybe it's not just the application, maybe it's the network as well. And this is really the meat and the potatoes of the platform here. This is why Cisco acquired the platform. Um, or the, the business rather. And the left-hand side is gonna be all the Thousand Eyes offices that are configured for this test. This dark blue nodes here are going to be the, uh, the Thousand Eyes WAN. These lighter blue nodes are gonna be our ISP connections. And then these dark green nodes here are actually Salesforce's environment. So as I mentioned before, how we're penetrating the front door and showing three, four, five, 10 different hops into Salesforce's environment. You can see here the deliverable is all the way to Chicago, Illinois, where we're seeing that's deliverable to their uh, server there, and then their uh, server out in Washington, D.C. So all the way extension, only handshake at the front door, but all the way through. Um, and we like to keep it simple, stupid here, a thousand eyes. Where is the issue? It is the red nodes. So we're seeing where our WAN pairs with our public ISP, so our ingress egress point we're seeing that there's about 11% loss here. So two of 18 packets are being dropped. Who's the provider? Cogent. Of course, we deal with them all the time, have some major issues with them. Um, and, and this is great to understand. So now we're starting to kind of peel that back. But there is another node here that we're seeing because everybody always asks me, well, it seems like that's one deviation outside of your internal network, right? This is your WAN. It's only one hop. That can't take too long to find. And maybe that's right in a sense, right? Maybe, maybe that only took an hour or two hours to find. In this sense, we're actually seeing another provider drop packets. We're seeing even more loss here. So we're seeing 12% forwarding loss, two of 17 packets are being dropped. And we're seeing Comcast is the provider that's having the issue. So not only is it Cogent, but it is Comcast as well, where we're seeing that, that forwarding loss. Um, and then my next question is always, Great, I can see this, I understand this, I know where the outages are, how, how do I actually resolve this problem? And what we're taking a look at here is called a Thousand Eyes share link. The share link is a link that I could copy and paste, throw in this chat, and everybody could do exactly what I'm doing. So it's a read-only interactive link that allows you to go in and hover over each one of these nodes, understand exactly what's going on. And this can be configured with your servicing platforms and your servicing applications to be escalated directly to these providers. So this is configured correctly in real time. This is not only going to analyze, understand, and enable this, this link to, uh, to be escalated, it'll deliver this directly to those providers saying, hey, here's the outage. This is why, where, and how it's happening. Please go fix this. So that's the beauty of Thousand Eyes. That's kind of an easily condensed uh, demo here. Sometimes it can get a little crazy, almost like crazy spaghetti arms all over the place, but 
this one's very easily digestible, very easy to understand. Um, and I think this really drives the value home. So think in terms of anything that you're relying on. This is a very similar reading that we can bring to you and your teams to really help isolate, mitigate, and just make your business more, more operational and optimal in a day-to-day -day practice. So any questions in regard to that? Can I clarify anything? Is there anything kind of looming? All right. Well, it's a great demo. Great thank demo. you so much. So you could do that end to end for any employee working at home. Any employee Almost working from home will show everything from the computer connection to their Wi-Fi router at home across the VPN into the public internet and then deliverable to any type of application or infrastructure that you're accessing. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Yeah, I mean, it's it's new. It's it's pretty relevant. Like, we're not new as a company, but I, I've, I've been here for years. I mean, I, I was on the back end of, of really digging in and, and getting just qualified opportunities from cold calling and emailing and all that good stuff. And people were just like, we have solutions in place. We have our APMs. We have our, our monitoring solutions. And when we can get this in front of those customers that we're pushing back right away, we have the solar winds, we have the Dynatrace, they're like, wow, I've never seen anything that has existed like this, especially giving me the extent of visibility and then being able to, to troubleshoot immediately. Um, you know, the, the war room stories have happened over and over again. I, I used to work the Australian region and, and they were one of the biggest supermarkets in, in the country. And we did a six month POC with them. They were kind of lagging us along. Holidays came around. They were like, ah, well, all right, we're, we're kind of over this. It looks more proactive. And, uh, and right around Christmas time, all their POS systems went down. They were down for two days. I think they lost 18 million in two days. They called us up. We found the problem in 16 minutes and they were a customer the next day. So <laughs> nice great. little. And, and they're a SolarWinds customer? I'm sorry? And they were a SolarWinds customer? Oh, sorry. I was muted there. Yes, they were yeah. a SolarWinds customer. All right. That's great to know. So I had a couple of questions. Um, could, could you maybe, uh, are there integrations with ServiceNow? Um, Kirk, are you still on the line? I, I, he has a little bit more info on integrations. Yeah, absolutely. There's integrations with ServiceNow and um, others as well. So we, by integrations, the definition would be we forward our alerts into ServiceNow and then with that share link, you can click on it and see exactly what's going what's going on with it as well and i can kind of show you that real fast um yeah yeah that'd be great and uh, the second question i had was uh the, the webex agents that were announced on the webex one conference are they ga now the they're not yet i don't believe so yet um so i'll, I'll come to that in just a second um Alert rules, when you're in the alert dashboard here, add new alert rule, notifications. Well, we can, first of all, in the settings, we have all different types of network and we can voice, and we have different types of errors that you could trigger off of, off the SIP server or an RTP, uh, including raw scores that generates networking, loss latency and jitter, and there's kind of cool stuff along the way that you can do with these. Um, but the notifications here, when you can figure a webhook here, that's one way to do it. And then you can see the integration here with Slack, PagerDuty, ServiceNow, and AppDynamics. So that's there. Um, the WebEx that you're talking about is what we did was added client, we added, um, cloud agents. So what does that mean? The cloud agents are outside in story, right? And so they're already installed. So this is really looking from a customer digital experience. So this is up and running. This is how we do a POC or a trial. This is how you would see how your your um, your website is performing, uh, whether you're under a DDoS attack, whether you're in DNS, CDN, DDoS, that BGP, that vernacular, those verbs and those things. 
but we have these agents in broadband locations across the country, Azure. So if you had an, if you were, you know, you could have an Azure agent in Chennai, India, testing to www.nfl.com kind of thing. You could be in Google and you could be testing to your AWS instance from wherever AWS, Alibaba, you want to see how it gets to the firewall in China. We'll show you how that does get to your website, but the WebEx agents are here. What that allows us to do is pretty cool. Um, it allows us to actually test do an R, a real time protocol RTP test to the Verizon location from your, your location on premise. And so what that does is it may go out 5G, it could go out internet, it could go out MPLS, right? Because we're all doing SDN. So when it goes into and it hits the WebEx server with an RTP, the RTP will respond. Well, those are two different paths, which is really cool because you're going across the internet. So actually seeing those two different paths uh, and where the failures are. From an um, example of the on-premise agent, Another story that goes with this. I had a, my kids came home, two kids yelling, screaming right at 3 30. I was on a call with collaboration team and my WebEx started glitching out. So we looked at it post analysis and we could see here's my PC. This is Kirk O'Connor right here. Hard to do. This is my PC. I had plenty of uh, memory, plenty of CPU. My wireless was good. I had 351 megs. I had 90. I, I didn't have any problems with. Web. I haven't had any internet issues this whole time. So I'm like, this is odd, right? My path trace was going well. My redirects, not much. My waterfall to WebEx was fine. But what changed was this loss on my gateway. Watch that loss gateway. And I go forward and you'll see it's 40% right now. And then it went to 90%. So I lost my gateway. So what does that tell me, right? My PC was fine, my wireless was fine, my internet not so fine, but my gateway was the issue, not the bandwidth. And then uh, everything else, WebEx was fine, so. so. So the kids came home and turned on all their electronic devices, you're saying? Yep. No, I'm not. I'm saying they, they didn't have anything to do with it, really. It was the gateway on the route that changed, right? That gateway on the router, the kids come home all the time and their phones hook into it. So they, I've never had an issue. There was a, a reboot or some kind of gateway loss from the Verizon. You remember what a gateway does is it comes in with public IP addresses and converts it to the private IP address in the house. That gateway got rebooted or something. But it wasn't WebEx and it wasn't my PC and it wasn't my wireless. So that's the that's how granular we can get to it. Keep asking questions. I don't even know. It's just saying from a, from a, from a troubleshooting perspective, you were able to eliminate all the things that weren't the cause to your issue, which in a working environment, an enterprise environment, that can save you tons and tons of time. <laughs> and you and you multiply that by thousands of users or hundreds of users. Yeah. You start aggregating that data set, you can start seeing trends and analysis that allows you to negotiate better with vendors as well. Yeah. So that's a cool part too. One way I've been able to use Thousand Eyes personally, I have an Xfinity one gig circuit at home and almost religiously at two or three in the, in the morning, two or 3 a.m. every morning, I have a blip. And I know this because my Meraki firewall VPN fails and it comes back a few minutes later and I've called Xfinity several times to say, hey guys, why does this always happen? They're like, it's not us, we don't know. So I turned on my Thousand Eyes agent and now I had full visibility through my entire path and I called them with that information. They're like, oh yeah, well, we do do maintenance at that time. So I was able to hold their feet to the fire. You know, you can use this to, to help people stick to their SLAs also. Okay, thank you, Kirk. And I think we can pass the ball over to Brian if we don't have any more questions. All right, Brian, the floor is yours. 
It's super. Thanks, Nate. It's good to see you and Kirk again. I, uh, yeah. You know, it reminds me when I first thought of doing this kind of thing before COVID, I didn't know what I was doing. And uh, I beta tested it on Friends in Vermont, where I'm from. And so all of you in Albany, et cetera, uh, I'm right across the border. I grew up in Manchester, Vermont and Dorset, uh, 45 minutes away, an hour away. And I beta tested this idea that I had um, to taunt my friends when the snow was coming down and it was warm here in Napa. So for those of you on the East Coast, it's it's not full Napa weather, but it's it's a really beautiful day. Welcome uh, to Bouchain. Um, when I first started this, I remember one dinner party. I encouraged a friend to have a dinner of 12 people. And my the their Wi-Fi on their end, every time somebody new walked into the house, kept getting slower and slower and slower. And finally I wasn't able to <laughs> to test my beta test my virtual wine tasting. Um I am broadcasting from uh, one of the oldest wineries in the southern part of the Napa Valley. So Bouchain is a family-owned winery. It's celebrating its 41st year this year. And we've been owned by the same family since 81. Uh, about four months ago, we had a big uh, heavy metal uh, leftover disco party here on our deck. So I'm broadcasting from what used to be my my corner office. And now most of the time it's uh, for virtual wine tastings. And um, it's an opportunity that the slow moving wine business never had before COVID. Uh, I love sitting in on these conversations because I feel like I'm transported to the real world. Uh, Thousand Eyes is is concerned with things that are ever moving. And it occurred to me as I was watching this today that the wine business is never moving uh, except for once a year when we harvest. So in the bottle that you have is one of our very finest Pinot Noirs. Why is one bottle like that one ninety dollars when you can go to the local grocery store and get a eleven dollar Pinot Noir, a fifteen dollar Pinot Noir, a twenty five, a thirty five dollar Pinot Noir, and um, uh, it has to do with with weather, but it only the weather conditions change once a year. So that's our thousand eyes moment. Um, a lot of people from the East Coast, particularly, I certainly didn't know this, don't realize that the Napa Valley is only about two percent of all of our country's wine. It's the most uh, notorious uh, region, and basically, it's not a very good region for Pinot Noir, except from where I am broadcasting from. So. The whole Napa Valley is 30 miles long. You can drive the whole thing in an hour. And uh, where I am is right up against the San Francisco Bay. So that is literally our vineyard right there. The bottle of wine in front of you, which I hope you all opened up when we first started talking to give it a chance to breathe, uh, is a 10 minute walk from where I'm seated. And we walk up that vineyard to overlook the San Francisco Bay in San Francisco. So that's where I am. But if I got into a car right now and drove 15 minutes, I'd get to Robert Mondavi Winery in the middle of the Napa Valley. And in that time, in 15 minutes in the summertime in the Napa Valley, the temperature would go up 20 degrees. So when you're standing in a store, if you've ever wondered what the difference is between the Pinot Noir section and the, and the heavy metal band section, the football player section of Cabernet and Merlot and the big, dense, chewy wines, it's that 15 minute drive in the Napa Valley. Um, lighter, more delicate grapes uh, need cooler weather conditions. So for those of you who like more crisp Sauvignon Blanc or more crisp wines, they tend to be from colder weather regions. And those of you who like big, dense sumo wrestler style, chewy, uh, you know, um, tomato bisque soup style wines, they tend to be from hotter regions. And the interplay there, the yin yang is very finite. It's a, you know, the difference between a, a, a really great wine and, um, and a mediocre one might be the average of five degrees over the, over the course of a growing season in the wine business. It's one of the big differences between wine and, um, and beer and booze. Uh, we're reliant on this subtle shift. And um, so before COVID, the wine industry represented uh, the last big innovation was practically when the Romans 3,500 years ago go into France and realize that uh, they can harvest French oak barrels and store their wine and ship wine around the world with them. And it changed the mouthfeel and the flavor of wine. So the wine you guys are having is a variation of what I have in my glass here. This is a rosé and it's a rosé made out of Pinot Noir. You have one of our very finest Pinot Noirs from one of the top little sections of our hundred acre vineyard here. 
We only make 15,000 cases, which uh, is a fraction of basically anything you can touch under $35 in a store. So if you're used to buying your wine, uh, there are some really great wines at $25, but they're probably made in 30,000 case lots. The wine that you have today is a 200, 250 uh, case lot from one particular hill, one particular weather region. The wine that I have is from a, a different part of our vineyard that doesn't produce as rich a flavor in Pinot Noir. So we hold it aside for this rosé. And so one of the things I just wanted to say is that the wine you have versus the wine I have is the difference between putting a tea bag in hot water for 30 seconds versus five minutes. In the wine business, the grape skin is our tea bag. And to produce a red wine, any red wine in the world, you're thinking about soaking your tea bag, your, your grape skins, for about two weeks in the grape juice. So the world of the inside of the grape and the world of the outside of the grape are, believe it or not, um, developed at different times of the day. And you can, in a really hot area, you can really get a lot of uh, juice development, but it might be too hot to get an interesting suntan. And believe it or not, the interesting suntan in the wine world, what makes a great red wine interesting, happens, believe it or not, at night when the temperature drops. So in the Napa Valley, the big difference between here and back home where I'm from, where you guys are, it might be 105 degrees at Robert Mondavi during the day or 85 degrees down here and uh, just 15 minutes away in the southern part of Napa. But every part of the Napa Valley experiences a 40 degree drop basically every single night in the summer. So during the day when it's warm, the inside of the grapes get developed. At night when the temperature drops, molecules are deposited in the grape skins. It's the big difference between Napa and Long Island. Uh, Buffalo, where you might get a really nice bright Riesling up in uh, the Finger Lakes regions of our country or Niagara Falls. Um, but down here, we have a richer day, a bigger day, and so we get more muscle on the bones. I don't know if anyone came to the tasting today with a question about the wine industry or about how to buy a better bottle of wine, but I, I'd love to answer any questions if any of you have them. Um, there are some things, uh, three basic things to know. One, always open up your red wine an hour beforehand. The Napa Valley has blown me away in terms of now that I've, I'm working in the wine industry and realizing just how much a, white, a red wine can benefit if you just open it up just a little before you drink it. The other is a big East Coast thing. And uh, easier to perpetrate here in Napa where it's 100 every single day, but it's, uh, I, I made this mistake my whole life. Don't open up your red wine at home and have your friends over on your terrace for dinner and plop your bottle outside when it's 85 degrees or 90. Uh, you want, believe it or not, to drink your red wine, the one that you have right up there with a little subtle chill, just as almost as cold as you'd have it, not quite as a rosé or a, a sparkling wine. You uh, think of having a coffee at too hot or too cold a temperature. You kind of, you don't want it blazing your mouth, you know, blasting your mouth with heat. You don't want it too cold because you're not going to taste some of the richer quality of the coffee. You need it in the middle. Same thing with beer, there's nothing worse than a, except for Guinness, there's nothing worse than a, just a bland room temperature beer. Um, wine, if you have it too hot, you're drinking, if it's 85 degrees this summer or this spring and you're having friends over for dinner um, and you're drinking it at, at room temperature, you're drinking at 25 degrees too hot. You're losing the top notes of the symphony or the bottom notes of the symphony when you have your wine too hot or too cold. So surprising, for red wine and for your more expensive white wines, anything over $35, have it with just a subtle chill, not too chilled and certainly not at, at room temperature. And the other thing is, and, and this is kind of nice about what you're drinking, it's had a chance to change its story in the bottle. An older bottle of wine, unlike almost any other product in the world, really does change its story. And so when, if you're in a store and you're wondering what to buy, you can save yourself $5 or spend $5 more and get twice as good a bottle of wine if you pay attention to the subtle changes of a year, a vintage. Older wine will be more integrated in its flavor. It's like having a tomato sauce the next day. Um, does anyone have a question about wine that I can answer? This is probably the first time in two years 
during COVID, we were totally closed for a year and a half and all of our business was done virtually. We're at a nexus point in the wine industry. The American wine industry for the first time in its history over the last 10 years is imploding. It's not growing. Since World War II, American GIs came back from uh, the war and they were interested in wine thanks to their European experiences. And wine production in America, wine interest in America and the American population grew for 50 years just like that. And now our population stabilized, but millennials like booze more than they like wine. And so these uh, intergalactic moments where I can broadcast from the winery are really actually important to the wine business because it's the first time that we need to tell our story differently. So I can't thank you enough for letting me be here. Um, the, what I'll say is that when you're in a store, if you come across a brand you don't know, or you're in a store and you're looking for a value proposition, so to speak, try to find a label that has more and more specific geographic information. The bottle in front of you says Bouchain. And if you knew what we were, uh, you'd say, oh, they're, they're cool. They've been around for 40 years female winemaker, 100 acres that they have been gardening for 40 years, uh, and a so-called estate style wine. It's not a fake brand. But the other information about geography, it's like doing a Google search uh, or a map search for a party. It's the geographic information on a wine bubble you want to pay attention to even more maybe than the price. The more and more specific information on a bottle of wine is your key to happiness in terms of spending $5 more or $10 more and getting twice as good a bottle of wine. On any store shelf or in any restaurant, you'll find that there'll be a wine that says just California in the Merlot section. And then uh, practically right next to it will be a wine that says Napa Valley or Sonoma or Paso Robles, whatever. And then even more specific information, sort of like... Um, you know, it, it's not just Albany, New York, but it's a, a block in, in Albany, New York that you want to go to. And the wine business will direct your consciousness. And there are different levels of quality, typically, based on geography. The more and more specific, specific information on a wine label uh, will lead you to better and better wine quality. And you might spend $5 more or $5 less, but it's a nice way of demystifying the store shelf. Um, those of you who are not drinking the wine today with us, just know don't open it up just for a slapstick moment with somebody who doesn't like wine. Um, even at Bouchain, with only 15,000 cases made, in the 100 acres behind me, there are different sections that, that experience different weather patterns. Believe it or not, if, you, if your vineyard gets morning sun, which is colder, slightly cooler, than afternoon sun, which is warm and blazing and hot, your vineyard will experience um, different uh, photosynthesis and different mouthfeel. And so this particular uh, hill, it, we, it's planted differently, thus the terrace name on the label. It's from the hottest part of our vineyard. And thanks to Cisco right now, we're busy not only determining why is this part of our vineyard so special versus a part that's 75 feet away, but we now have sensors that are telling us, okay, What's the average wind? What's the average heat? What's the average sun uh, above the grape line, above the leaf zone, and below the leaf zone? So that we can figure out how to maximize uh, what Bouchain brings to the table, literally. And what do I mean by that? Well, footnote to your Napa Valley experience today an acre of land in the Napa Valley planted in vines is worth about $500,000. You're drinking today one of my most expensive wines. Uh, Bouchain has a, a very impressive history in the Pinot Noir zone of the Napa Valley. You're practically looking at all of it. Most of Napa is too hot to produce Pinot Noir, which is why you'll see a lot from Sonoma. So this way, I've got Sacramento. It's 120 degrees there, half the time in the summer, 115. The other direction over here, I've got the, the Pacific Ocean. And quite unlike the East Coast, you don't go to the Pacific Ocean in the summertime to get a suntan, to enjoy the... Uh, 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 any kind of a swim, it's freezing and it's foggy. And when it's 85 here or 105 here, it's 55 degrees there and you can't see the front of your car. And it's the interplay between these two zones that Napa sits in the middle of to, uh, to create its, its best flavors in wine. And that's what we've sent you. Um, and in our case, my goal is to take the Cisco sensors that we have in our vineyard 
and to figure out, okay, how do we take our $35 wine and make that into a $135 wine by reconfiguring the vineyard over a five or 10 year period. So the world of wine business is, is ancient and so molasses slow compared to the cool stuff you guys are doing. So I, I, you make me feel hip every time I get a chance to, uh, to co-host. So cheers to you. If anyone has any questions, let me know. Thank you for everything. Thank you so much, Brian. That was excellent. Thank you. Will, I think, I think it's you. Yeah, thank you, Brian. I appreciate that. Let me just make sure I'm not muted. Okay. So, well, we'd like to thank everyone for participating today. Uh, we hope everyone had a great time learning about Thousand Eyes and also enjoying some very nice wine. Um, as a quick reminder, please let us know how we can help you either with starting your deployment, deployment or answering questions or even setting you up with a free two-week trial so that you can see how Thousand Eyes can benefit your organization. Uh, my contact information is on the screen. Please do not hesitate to reach out to myself or your Aspire account manager with any questions. Thank you so much. We really appreciate your time and have a good night.